Good evening, and uh, thank you to Kathy and Nancy for inviting me and to the other panelists for uh, sharing this time. I need to start with a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, the comments that I'm going to make are based on personal reflection. Uh, they're more intuitive than academic or theological, yet I hope that they contain substance from both those fields. And Nancy said that I'm here representing um, Atlantic Baptists, and if you know many Baptists, and if you've been in the room with two or three, you already know that there's probably three or four opinions among us. So I don't pretend to, to necessarily represent uh, Baptists, but I do come from that tradition, and I work for the convention in St. John, and uh, have been working with Nancy for many years, and uh, I'm happy to be working towards a day when, when we're better equipped and more willing to, to stand with those who are victims of intimate partner violence. Uh, I'll, I'll show a little bit of my academic roots as a sociologist and quote Emile Durkheim, who was a French sociologist who in 1897 published a document or a book on suicide in which he contended that the causes of suicide were to be found in social factors and not just in individual personalities. He said that if a person commits suicide, that's a personal tragedy, but if the rate of suicide changes in a society, uh, then that's a public issue, and we should look to the society to see um, what's changed. I think the same kind of thinking can be applied to intimate partner violence. It is a personal tragedy for sure um, in every single case, but it's also a public issue. As the rate of violence changes, we need to look not just to the individual, but to social factors. And of course, we're always aiming at a moving target. Individuals change, and so too does the social context within which the violence occurs. I don't think any of us would be here tonight if we didn't believe that we can be part of a positive change in this area. It's not social engineering exactly, but it's investing in the world around us according to the principles of our faith and then celebrating in the consequences of diligent obedience. So when we think about relationships, I think you know, we all know that relationships are complicated to be sure, but we need to look to the deeper and broader context of identity and culture. And in these days, I, I watched a little YouTube video the other day that was quite helpful, and it talked about the, the, um, the Y generation and some of the uh, characteristics of the Y generation. And it talked about the importance of expectations and the fact that when expectations are very high and reality doesn't match the expectations, then there's a lot of frustration, a lot of anger, a lot of hurt, confusion. So I wonder how, in terms of expectations, how do we anticipate or envision our intimate partner relationship. So many of the women in the documentary uh, expressed shock or surprise that violence entered their marriage very early on. Many of them say that they weren't brought up to expect this kind of violence or that it's, or they said it's inconsistent with their ideas around a faith-based marriage. When expectations fall short of the, re of the reality, it's confusing, confusing and potentially debilitating. Fundamentally, there's a violation of trust. But of course, we also need to consider the expectations that men bring into these relationships. I wonder if it's possible, and I worry, that the rate of intimate partner violence will continue to rise as the gap grows between expectations and the reality of what we experience. How do we bridge that gap? How do we, how do we narrow the gap? Intimate partner violence, as they said again and again in, in the video, is about control. But I also wonder if the feelings that accompany the sense of losing control become a trigger for those who feel that their life is not what they expect or want. Perhaps this fuels a slow burning anger or even rage with no appropriate outlet and they take it out on those they can. If they let their anger explode at work or at church or amongst friends, they'll be disciplined, they'll be fired, arrested, rebuked, isolated. Their home becomes the only place and their intimate partner the only person for the release of that slow burning rage. And once the cycle of violence begins, it won't stop on its own. We know that. There needs to be some form of intervention. The social fabric of Canadian society these days is not, I think, an ally in this process of narrowing the gap. But what about faith communities? Misrepresentations, as it was mentioned in the, in the uh, documentary, misrepresentations of sacred texts provide a way to rationalize the rage and the violence. Perhaps it's a mechanism for self-preservation but often with deadly consequences for the intimate partner and for their children. I think we would all agree that no sacred text should ever be used to excuse intimate partner violence, and yet they are. And this is another and profound violation of trust. 
How can faith communities, and more specifically, the leaders of those communities, help? I think there are a number of things, many of which are beginning to happen in different, uh, in different faith communities. First, we need to speak truth. We need to work together, and it's, it's delightful to be part of a panel that's uh, interfaith in its nature. We need to know what we're aiming for. What does a healthy relationship look like? What are the first indications that a relationship is not healthy and is potentially violent? We need to have the courage and the will and the protocols to intervene at the first signs of trouble. We need to work with children and youth to help them prepare for healthy friendships and then healthy intimate relationships. And I would say in that order and not the reverse. We need to build positive community and values of community. We need to prepare the upcoming leaders of our faith communities to deal with these issues. We need to help the whole community understand the signs and symptoms, but also how to be honest about intimate partner violence. And of course, we need to pray. Pray for wisdom, courage, safety, healing. Intimate partner violence is a criminal offense, but it is also an offense, an offense against our humanity and our creator. Religious leaders of all faith traditions must speak about these things, not in hushed tones, but clearly and with authority. Uh, as Nancy says in the video, we can be a, a powerful prophetic voice. Humanity has a long history of abuse and violence, taking many forms, but always having the effect of destruction. We need to speak against this destruction and provide different models. I was recently, just a, a month ago in Columbia with a group of students, students from St. Stephen's University, and we were hosted by the Columbia team of the Mennonite Central Committee, MCC. And I was very impressed by what they call a ministry of accompaniment. <clears throat> And as you likely know, Colombia is a country that has been embroiled in civil violence for over 50 years. And Mennonites are pacifists. Perhaps more accurately, they be, could be described as active pacifists. They don't believe in war or in violence as a means to resolve differences. They believe in peace, but they don't just love peace as an abstract, abstract concept. They are actively engaged in peacemaking. They do it by walking with or accompanying those who are embroiled in conflict. I think this is what we need to aim for in the area of intimate partner violence. In international studies, we talk a lot about the difference between aid and development. Aid is providing for people's immediate needs, shelter for people who are displaced from their homes due to violence or natural disasters, food, water, and medical care for people who don't have access due to political, economic, social, or environmental conditions. Development has a longer term view. It addresses the underlying issues that periodically give rise to the need for emergency aid. Development may be providing microfinancing or helping people to organize and adv advocate for economic or humanitarian justice. As we think about our response to intima intimate partner violence, it seems that there's a clear need for both aid and development. We need to come alongside those who are experiencing violence today but there's also a need to dig up the roots and deal with them. I think that aid will necessarily focus on the victims, but development will also consider the context for the violence. I'm really very grateful to the work of the Religion and Violence team and for other teams around the globe that are working to tackle intimate partner violence from both ends, the aid end and the development end. This documentary, I think, is a great tool for us. It allows us to hear the voices of women Women who could be our friends, our sisters, our aunts, ourselves. We hear them and we believe them. But as we sit here tonight, we believe that intimate partner violence is both real and deadly. But it's not enough just to believe, just to hear. We need to be willing to walk into the darkness, to hold the hand of the woman or man who's caught in this cycle, lending our strength to them so that they can face the fear and find a way out of the darkness. We can do it as individuals, and I suspect most of you here, here tonight have and do, but it will be more powerful and more effective when we do it as communities, as faith com communities, and even more powerfully as we walk, uh, work across the borders that often separate communities of different faiths. Thank you. Uh, well, I, for sure, prevention is very important, but I suspect that the purpose of this documentary is, is one part of a much bigger project. And, bef you know, there are still people, unfortunately, who don't really believe that this happens um, in general the, the, to the extent that it does or in specific cases. So I think just sort of uh, to think about that in context, but as another step in, in the overall project of eliminating intimate partner violence prevention is, is certainly a, a very important 
aspect and understanding uh, gender roles and under, as you said, preparing people for, for what to expect in marriage across our faith traditions I think is very important. Yeah, I think if I, it would be convenient for me to forget the question actually because the question was I think what our faith traditions are doing. Um, but since I haven't forgotten the question. <laughs> um, I mean, it, I do think that there are, we're, the Baptist denomination is, is at least recognizing, I think the seminary is starting to um, realize that pastors need training in this area, but whatever we've done is only a very small drop in the bucket. But I'm, and I, I don't want to be defensive about that at all, but I do think that as we begin to walk with people, I mean, it's very difficult. It's, there are, you know, breaking cycles is not a simple thing. It's, it's like a rerouting that, that may take generations. Um, it's a lot, you have to be in it for the long haul. There was a woman in our congregation who I sort of fell into helping her when she finally left her abusive husband, and it was the second time that she left. And it, I, you know, I, I'm not claiming any great um, involvement in this, but I did go with her to court and, you know, was kind of there to, to talk and process. And, you know, as a social scientist, it gave me an opportunity really to, to a little bit of participant observation goes a long way. But the reality is it takes a long time to walk with people through that. It was two years from the time the abuse happened to until her husband was finally sent, found guilty sentence was sent away I mean it was two very difficult years for her to maintain her sanity there were children involved she she was not a healthy person and so dealing with her own issues as well as have, having had the courage to leave so all of that to say you know in some ways as as Monty said I think you know we can look at the these women in the video who are now in a position where they have left and they have a degree of of a sense that they have survived. Um, they're not victims, they're survivors. But they're, I mean, they are, you know, the minority. There are so many people. And I know that they use the figure, I think, three to seven times of trying to leave. But that's, that's not the real figure. The real figure is the number of cycles of abuse before they even make the first attempt, which I know years ago, the, the research was 39 cycles of abuse. And every time around the cycle, they're, their self-esteem, their sense of self-worth is, is minimized. Um, so, yeah, again, I'm speaking more about the challenges from the point of view of the victim. And, and I think, you know, faith communities, we need to be places where people are authentic and, and on that and many other issues, and we simply aren't. We're not safe places for people that are marginalized by mental illness, by abuse, by, and, and I think too of the perpetrators, you know, where, who, where, where is a safe place for a person who is already demonstrating those tendencies and maybe loathes themselves for it? And, you know, I think, I know very little about perpetrators, but I speculate, you know, and this is the beauty of social science. I, I love social science. <laughs> you know, in the physical sciences, there's a law, there are a number of laws. One of them is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, that just isn't the case in the social world. We can take any event, any situation, and, and it's not predictable. It's not absolutely there's no correlation between what one action will result in. It's a complex um, mess often. Um, but I think about from the point of view of the perpetrator, and you know, I, I don't understand, but I do have a fear for one thing. As we empower women and as we teach girls what to expect in their dating relationships and in marriage, and we teach them to stand up for themselves, you know, if, like this is the, the cynic or the skeptic in me, if, Intimate partner violence is the is sort of the last domain for this outlet of rage or anger that is simmering, I think, in our society and particularly amongst men, but also amongst women. But if it's the last outlet, where if women start to stand up for themselves, where how is that anger going to be resolved? You know, we send people off to wars, you know, like we have all kinds of and they come back from war with post traumatic stress disorder. Um, you know, it's uh, I, I think it's a hugely complicated thing, and it's not enough just to address the problems for the victims. I think we also have to be aware of the deeper, the soil in which all of this is, is growing. And, and the perpetrators, the offenders, um, men who, who lash out, 
and, and do it over and over again. You know, and I think there must be cycles from their perspective as well. Cycles of true repentance and remorse and wanting to do it differently. But then this, the cycle goes around for them as well. So all to say, I, I, I think that whatever step that we can make as faith communities to prepare people uh, for healthy relationships is, is, is incredibly important. Um, but to recognize just how deep these issues run.